Uh, so tonight we conclude reading The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis with chapter 14. And suddenly, all was changed. I saw a great assembly of gigantic forms, all motionless, all in deepest silence, standing forever about a little silver table and looking upon it. And on the table, there were little figurines like chessmen who went to and fro doing this and that. And I knew that each chessman was the idolum or puppet representation of some of the great presences that stood by. And the acts and motions of each chessman were a moving portrait, a mimicry or pantomime, which delineated the inmost nature of his giant master. And these chessmen are men and women as they appear to themselves and to one another in this world. And the silver table is time. And those who stand and watch are the immortal souls of those same men and women. And then vertigo and terror seized me, and clutching at my teacher, I said, Is that the truth? And then... Is all that I have been seeing in this country false? These conversations between the spirits and the ghosts, were they only the mimicry of choices that had really been made long ago? Or, might ye not say well, say as well, anticipations of a choice, to be made at the end of all things. But ye do better to say neither. Ye saw the choices a bit more clearly than ye could see them on earth. The lens was clearer, but it was still seen through the lens. Then I ask of a vision in a dream more than the vision in a dream can give. A dream? Then then am I not really here, sir? No, son, said he kindly, taking my hand in his. It is not so good as that. The bitter drink of death is still before you. Ye are only dreaming. And if ye come to tell of what ye have seen, make it plain that it was but a dream. See, you make it very plain. Give no poor fool the pretext to think ye are claiming knowledge of what no mortal knows. I'll have no Swedenborgs and no Vale Owens among my children. God forbid, sir, said I, trying to look very wise. He has forbidden in that's what I'm trying to tell ye. As he said this, he looked more scotch than ever. I was gazing steadfastly on his face. The, the vision of the chessman had faded, and once more the quiet woods and the cool light before sunrise were all about us. And then, still looking at his face, I saw there something, saw there something that sent quite a quiver through my whole body. I stood at that moment with my back to the east and the mountains, and he, facing me, looked towards them, his face flushed with a new light. A fern, thirty yards behind him, turned golden. The eastern side of every tree trunk grew bright, shadows deepened. All the time there had been a bird, there had been bird noises, trillings, chatterings, and the like, but now suddenly the full chorus was poured from every branch, cocks were crowing, there was music of hounds and horns, above all this ten thousand tongues of men and woodland angels, and the wood itself sang. It comes, it comes, they sang. Sleepers awake, it comes, it comes, it comes. 
One dreadful glance over my shoulder I essayed, not long enough to see, or did I see, the rim of the sunrise that shoots time dead with golden arrows and puts to flight all phantasmal shapes. Screaming, I buried my face in the fold of my teacher's robe. The morning, the morning, I cried. I'm caught by the morning and I am yet but a ghost. But it was too late. The light, like solid blocks intolerable of edge and weight, came thundering upon my head. Next moment, the folds of my teacher's garment were only the folds of the old ink-stained cloth on my study table, which I had pulled down with me as I fell from my chair. The blocks of light were only the books which I had pulled off with it, falling about my head. I awoke in a cold room, hunched on the floor beside a black and empty grate, the clock striking three and the siren howling overhead. The end. Good night.